The Boy of the Painted Cave, chapters 3, 4, and 5. Chapter 3 Tao found a narrow spot along the stream and vaulted across. Picking his way carefully, he crept forward step by step. He had not gone far when the fiendish scream came again. It was followed by a series of long, hissing sounds and sobbing moans. For a moment, Tao hesitated, uncertain, his heart pounding. Maybe the clan people were right. Maybe there were demons and evil things in the shadowy place after all. If there were, he wondered, did he really want to see them? He waited, trying to make up his mind. Then he shrugged his shoulders and pushed on again, quietly, cautiously, watching each step. As he drew closer, the loud, piercing shrieks continued. They filled his ears and echoed through the sodden marshland. It was a strange, violent sound, one he had never heard before. He moved carefully, pushing his way through the briar thickets and around clumps of ferns that grew higher than his head. At any moment, he expected some evil demon to jump out of the underbrush. His heart leapt as the screams came again. They were only a few paces away now, and they came from a thick growth of bracken ferns near the base of a lone oak tree. He moistened his lips with the tip of his tongue and clutched his spear tightly, a knot of fear in the pit of his stomach. He took a deep breath and pushed his way through the alders. Then he stopped, stepped into the clearing, ready to come face to face with the evil spirit. Instead, he saw a demon with wings, an angry eagle owl sitting on the forest floor protecting her nest from the little wolf dog. Even for an eagle owl, she was huge, almost as high as Tao's waist. She loomed over the wolf dog as he crept in to get beneath her wings. She flew up, snapping her beak, slashing at him with her sharp talons. She hissed and screamed, her brownish-red feathers ruffled up in bristling rage. Her glossy black pupils, ringed with orange, glared back at the wolf, daring him to try again. Once more, the wolf rushed in to chase her off the nest, but the owl would not be led astray. She hovered over the three white eggs, protecting them from the hungry wolf. Please stop here and consider question number one. For a few moments, Tao stood aside, watching the battle. He liked the eagle owl's fierce courage. If there be demons, he whispered, you must be one of them. He felt sorry for her, too, for now she had a second enemy to face. Besides, he was afraid the little wolf dog might get hurt. Tao lifted his spear and leaned forward to push her away. She turned on him in savage fury, beating him with her wings, slashing at him with her curved talons. He threw up his arms to protect his face as she flew at him. Again, the wolf dog dashed in to draw her off, but the feathered demon refused to be chased away. Now the boy and wolf took turns, taunting her, trying to divert her attention. Each time they came too close, she turned quickly, screaming, slashing, driving them off. Soon Tao and the wolf dog were panting heavily as they tried again and again to reach the eggs. But the owl was tiring too. She was slowing down. She rocked back and forth on her short legs, her wings drooping weary from the uneven fight. Now Tao watched closely as the wolf dog attacked, each time leading the eagle owl farther from the nest. Then he saw his chance. On the next rush, the big owl lost her balance, floundering on the forest floor. Before she could recover, Tao rushed in and grabbed two of the large white eggs. Without looking back, he vaulted away, out of danger. Come, little friend, he shouted to the wolf dog. We have enough for both. He hobbled off under the trees, the wolf dog following as the owl vented its anger and wild shrieks of rage. When they were far enough away, Tao stopped. <sighs> Panting, he sat down with his back against the trunk of an old birch tree. He cracked one of the eggs on a stone, opened it, and dipped his tongue into the thick fluid. It tasted fresh and clean. It is good, he said. The eggs were newly laid. Then he gave it to the wolf dog. He made a hole in the second one, tilted back his head, and sucked out the contents. The wolf dog finished his and looked up as ex expecting more. No, said Tao, we will let the she-owl keep her single egg. The season is early. She will lay more. He looked down at the little animal. You are learning to hunt on your own. That is good. But it is not good to fight eagle owls. You must find something smaller. The wolf tilted its head, looked up for a moment. Then, as if he understood, he ran on ahead and disappeared into the woods. There were sandy glades within the slough where scattered clumps of bunch grass and bilberry bushes grew. Tao hobbled from one to another, poking with his spear, hoping to scare up some hidden game. 
He walked slowly from bush to bush, working his way up one side of the long glade and down the other. The morning was almost over, and he was about to give up when a swamp hare jumped out of one of the bushes and dashed across his path. Tao barely had time to brace himself. Taking quick aim, he threw his spear at the dodging animal. The weapon missed its mark, and Tao groaned as that rabbit escaped. A moment later, Tao saw the wolf dog come into the glade and begin sniffing from bush to bush. The scent of the rabbit was strong, and he soon found what he was looking for. The little animal began a slow, stalking moment, movement, creeping forward on his belly. He lifted each paw slowly, setting it down in the grass carefully. Tao watched patiently at the end of the glade. Once again, the hare suddenly dashed out of cover. The wolf dog bounded after it, following a zigzag course, twisting and swerving with each turn of its quarry. Tao raised his spear, steadying himself as the wolf dog drove the rabbit directly toward him. He aimed carefully, and as the frightened animal passed, he struck it cleanly on the first throw. As he picked up the rabbit, Tao smiled. You will be a good hunter, he told the wolf dog. First you find the eggs of the owl, now you find a rabbit. Please stop here and consider question number two. Even as Tao spoke, the little wolf was running ahead, going from bush to bush. With its head down, it sniffed the ground to pick up the scent. It worked in and around the thickets and between the tussocks of the grass. Before long, another rabbit leapt from under the bush. It ran around in circles, a brown whirl of fur, with the little wolf dog close at its heels. In its panic, it turned and headed straight for Tao. At the last moment, it saw the boy and doubled back. Tao groaned. The animal had escaped again. Then he felt a quick wave of relief as he saw it run directly into the waiting jaws of the wolf dog. Tao's heart was full of joy. The sun was still high in the heavens and they already had two rabbits. He sat on his heels in the middle of the glade and with his flint knife he skinned one of the hares and fed it to the little wolf dog. The other rabbit he tucked under his belt to take back to camp. As soon as the wolf dog had finished his meal, Tao put out his hand. This time, the little animal allowed itself to be touched. You are a good friend said Tao, patting the wolf dog's head and scratching him behind the ears. I will call you Ram, after the spirit of the hunt. They stayed together for, almost, for most of the day, roaming back and forth through the slough, and by late afternoon, Tao had three more rabbits and a leather pouch full of lemmings. When he was ready to leave, he looked down at Ram. He wished he could take the wolf dog back to camp with him, but he knew that Volt and the other hunters would kill it. Stay, he told Ram. There's a, here is a good place, and here you will be safe. There is much food, and you will not go hungry. As Tao walked away, the wolf dog started to follow. The boy turned. No, Ram, he said. You cannot come with me. Stay here in the slough and wait. I will come back again, and we will hunt together. The little wolf dog tilted his head to one side, and Tao knew he still did not understand. Go back, he ordered. When Ram did not move, Tao picked up stones and a handful of sod and threw them at the animal. Go back, he repeated. You cannot come with me. For another moment, Ram stood motionless, his yellow eyes staring at Tao. But when he saw the boy reach down to pick up more stones, he turned and ran off into the slough. As soon as the wolf dog had disappeared, Tao hurried on his way. It was growing dark. He heard the night jar trill. A squirrel scurried across his path and out on the plains. The prowling hyenas started their high-pitched giggles. Even in the darkness, Tao knew his way by the gray shadows of the trees, the boulders, and the shapes of cliffs. When he limped into camp, the clan women were cooking over the fires. They smiled when they saw the rabbits and the lemmings hanging from his belt. He first went to the hut of Kala and gave her a handful of mussels and three lemmings. Then he went to the center of camp where Volt and Garth were standing by the big fire. The gruff leader snatched the rabbits from the boy's hand. He held them up to the light of the fire, his dark eyes wide with surprise. These are freshly killed, he said. Tao winced and stared at the ground. I could not find the other, he said. It is good for you that you caught these, said Volt, glaring down at him. From now on, when you go out with the hunters, you will watch and learn and keep your mind on the hunting. Tao leaned on his spear, shifting from one foot to the other. He did not want to disobey, yet the anger within him would not let him be silent. I have railed now, he thought. With the wolf dog, I can bring back more food than the hunters. Instead, he said, I will hunt alone. What I catch, I will bring back to the camp. Volt shook his head violently, the ring of the bear claws around his neck rattling. 
You are like a stone, he roared. You learn nothing. I try to tell you, but you do not listen. The big man threw up his hands and looked hopelessly over his shoulders at Garth, who had come up behind him. Go then, he said to Tao. Go your own way, but hear my words. You will eat only when you bring in food. Once again, Tao felt the heat of anger rising in his cheeks. Maybe if we had a wolf dog, he said, it would help with the hunting. Volt's face grew red with rage, the livid scars standing out on his cheeks. We will have no evil wolf dogs at this camp, he shouted. They are a curse of demons. We will hunt like men, not like evil spirits. Please stop here and consider question number three. If wolf dogs are evil, then why do the mountain people hunt with them? asked Tao, surprised that he was speaking to Volt this way. Startled by the boy's impudence, Volt spat on the ground and grunted. Enough, he shouted. If you would hunt with an evil wolf dog, then go. Go live with the mountain people. Garth threw back his head and laughed grimly. Ha! Cross the river into their land and they will track you down like a jackal. Tao shrugged. He felt there was little use in talking to these men who would listen to only demons and evil spirits. Later that night, Tao sat by the fire in front of Kala's hut. He looked up at the overhanging cliffs and saw the endless flame burning bright in front of the entrance to the big cave. He had spent many winters in the protection of its shelter, but deep inside, through twisting tunnels and narrow passageways, lay the secret cavern. Only the Chosen One had ever seen it, but Tao had heard about it many times. It was a huge chamber, its walls covered with life-size paintings of horses, bison, and lions. Even the ceilings were painted with pictures of deer, bear, and boars. Here, the rituals of manhood were held. Here, the chosen ones were selected. Town knew that each clan had its own secret place, a special chamber hidden far back in the cliffs. Each clan had its image makers also, two or three chosen ones picked by the elders to paint in the caves. But Greybeard was the old master, the shaman, wandering from clan to clan, teaching and painting images of the great game animals to bring good luck in the hunting. Please stop here and consider question number four. Tao thought of this often. If only he were born of a leader or even a hunter, then he might someday become a chosen one. Many times he had asked Kala about his parents, but each time she shook his head. You are too young, she always said. Besides, it does not matter. But now he was older, and it did matter. Please stop here and consider question number five. Chapter four. Kala was alone with a new child as Tao stooped into the hut. Inside was a bed of straw and a smaller one for the child. A small cook fire burned near the back of the hut, sending a thin trail of blue smoke up through the vent hole. Kala's gray hair hung down over her shoulders and her face was lined from many hard winters. She often told Tao that she had a wrinkle for every fall of snow. In spite of the years of carrying firewood, skinning deer, making robes and sewing cloth clothing, Kala could still smile. She smiled with good, strong teeth, strong from chewing on pelts and skins to make them soft. Always, Kala spoke the truth, which often angered the elders, but they let her alone because she was wide, wise and knew much of the history of the clan. Please stop here and consider question number six. Before Tao spoke, she laid the new baby on an antelope rope, then stepped out of the hut, pretending to look around. When she came back, she squatted down cross-legged in front of the boy. She picked up one of the black muscles Tao had given her. You have been hunting down in the slough, she said. Tao was startled. He was surprised that she had guessed. It is the only place near where these can be found, she said, clicking her tongue. Tao saw the smile behind her. You know the slough, he whispered, as if sharing a secret between them. I used to go there when I was a girl. It was a good place filled with many berries, many mushrooms and fish. She smiled as she remembered, but that was before the bad thing happened, before it became a place of evil. What bad thing, Kala? The old woman shook her head. It was a long time ago. It is wrong, said Tao, that the clan people should go hungry when there is food nearby. Kala threw up her hands. You wish to question the elders? No, said Tao, it would do no good. Please stop here and consider question number seven. 
Tao looked at this old woman whose eyes were still young and green like the willow leaves. She was wise and good, and he could not have asked for a better mother. Yet he knew she was not of his blood. After a long silence, he said, Kala, I am 14 summers now, and I wish to know about my mother and father. <sighs> you will not give up, she said. Perhaps it is better that you do not know. But I must find out, said Tao, if I am ever to enter the ritual of manhood. In the eyes of the elders, it is very important. If I am the son of a leader or a hunter like Garth, I might someday become a chosen one. Then I can paint and draw. Kala shook her head sadly. You dream, boy. But your dreams are not true. As long as there are taboos, it can never be. But how can it hurt to know about my father? Kala placed the mussel shell into a bowl made from an empty ox bone. Of that, I will not tell you. I am one of the few who know, and it is a thing we do not speak of. Is it such a terrible thing? Yes, said the old woman. It is a terrible thing. Tao was silent for a moment. She will not say it, he thought, but it is because I have a bad foot. I do not walk as the others. That too is why I can never be a chosen one. <sighs> Tao sighed. He knew it would do no good to press her for an answer. My mother, then, he said. Tell me about my mother. The old woman nodded. She settled back on her bearskin rug, the strings of gray hair hanging down over her face. There was a peaceful look in her eyes as she spoke. Your mother was Vedra of the mountain people. She was 16 summers, and she was captured in one of the raids during the summer famine. You were early born in the middle of a cold winter, just like the one that had passed. Tao's heart was pounding. He had never heard his mother's name before. Vedra, he repeated the name quietly. Vedra. His dark eyes shining in the dim light, the soft sound rolling off the end of his tongue. Vedra of the mountain people. It is the law of the clan, the old woman continued, that weak and crippled children be taken up among the boulders and left for the hyenas, but your mother would not let you go. She sat in the corner of the big cave, holding you to her breast, keeping you warm, rocking back and forth, singing. Again and again, they tried to take you away, but she fought like a cave lion, screaming, biting, refusing to give you up. All through the long snows, she kept you alive. I brought her food. She would not leave the cave, and it was a winter where the winds found their way into the mountain. Before the moons of summer, she grew weak. When she died, your father ordered that you be left to die among the boulders. I brought you back and raised you for my own. The elders shook their heads, but I did not care. The man who is your father called it an evil curse. That is why you will not tell me his name? That is why I will never tell you his name. Please stop here and consider question number eight. Then tell me more about my mother, said Tao. What was she like? She was only a girl, said Kala, but she had the sense and wisdom of a woman. Always she worked with her hands. She made many things from the earth and waters. From pebbles and the bones of fish she made necklaces. From ivory and antlers she made beads and bracelets and needles. Even from the grass of the fields she made headbands and rings for the hair. Everyone loved the things she made and she gave them away freely. Tao looked up, his dark eyes wide as, she, as he smiled. Then she too was a maker? She too saw pictures in the sky and the meadows? Yes, said the old woman. I am sure she gave you the eyes to see beauty in the things around you, the animals, the trees, the mountains. I saw this even when you were a small child. You reached out for the flowers in the fields and you loved to watch birds and squirrels flying through the oak trees. It is the thing that makes you different from others. It is the thing they do not understand. Please stop here and consider question number nine. Tao's thoughts were racing ahead, his mind filled with new ideas. I am happy now, he said. The shadow flickered across his face. Now I know what I must do. If I cannot be a chosen one, I will live away from the clan. I will find a high cave up in the cliffs above the boulders. I will live out on the grasslands and in the oak forest. He hesitated, his voice falling out. And I will hunt in the slough where the fruit and game are plentiful. I will be a man in my own way. You are a dreamer. Kala smiled. Tao shook his head. No, Kala, look at me. My arms are strong. For three summers I have hunted and brought back food for Kala. She looked at him darkly. 
hunt them, she said, but do not make an enemy of the clan. If you make images or go into forbidden places, be sure you are not seen. Go your own way if you wish, but be careful. Tao reached out and touched her gently on the arm. Thank you, Akala, he said. Thank you for many things, but especially for what you have told me. I will come back often and bring you food. Tao went out and crouched, crouched by the big fire in the center of camp. He was thinking about what Kala had said when he heard a soft whimpering sound coming from beyond the light of the fire. He jumped up and saw a pair of yellow eyes staring at him from out of the darkness. Tao gasped in surprise. It was Ram. The foolish wolf dog had followed him. Please stop here and consider question number 10. Chapter 5 Throughout the little camp, the hunters heard the whimpering sound, too. A wolf! A wolf! shouted one. They reached for their spears, grabbing flaming torches from the fire, and rushed out into the darkness to reach the bushes and scrub wood. Volt heard the noise. Throwing his deerskin robe across his shoulders, he strode into the firelight. What is it? Wolf! a hunter responded. Kill the evil beast! shouted Volt, or it will be a curse on our camp! He followed the hunter, shaking his spear. Tao stood at the edge of the camp, listening to the men moving through the forest. He heard them beating the bushes with their spears, and he saw their torches bobbing in the darkness. He tried to think of some way to save the little wolf. To raise his voice or call out would only bring the hunters running. Somehow, he had to find Ram before they did. He gra grabbed a flaming stick from the fire and limped out into the night. He heard the hunters crashing through the underbrush, and he knew they were forming a wide circle, getting ready to close in and surround the wolf dog. Tao held his torch high, trying to see through the dark branches of the buckhorn trees. Ram, he whispered, his eyes searching the dim light. Where are you, Ram? Moments passed. The little animal had been frightened off by the noise, but Tao was sure he must be near. He called again, softly, Ram. Nothing moved. His torch flickered, and the wavering shadows of the buckthorn trees played tricks on his eyes. His heart sank as he heard the hunters come closer. The ring of spears was tightening. Just then, a gray shadow moved across the path, slinking out of the darkness. Tao waited as the animal crept toward him, whimpering. It was Ram. Tao leaned down and pushed him back. Go, he whispered. Get away, quickly. Ram refused to move. His eyes, he stood there, looking up at Tao, a fearful look in his yellow eyes. Tao picked up a stick as if to throw. Go, he ordered sharply, but it was too late. Tao heard the voices of the hunters only a few paces away. The little wolf was nearly surrounded. Quickly, Tao sprang forward. He thrust his torch into the damp earth, quenching the flames, then threw it aside. He curled his leg of his bad foot around the shaft of his spear and vaulted ahead. Wolf, wolf, he shouted loud enough for the hunters to come. Come, he whispered fiercely to the wolf dog. Stumbling, lurching through the forest, Tao heard their pounding feet as the hunters picked up the trail. Without looking back, Tao hurtled over the ground, dodging between the trees and brushed bushes. The wolf dog followed close behind as Tao ran into the night. Branches whipped across his face, tree roots caught at his feet holding him back. But if he could run fast enough, long enough, he knew he would outrun the hunters and save Ram. Breathing hard, he pushed his way through the underbrush, listening to the grunts and shouts of the angry men as they came after him. He ran faster and faster, twisting and turning through the trees in the brush, trying to throw them off the track. But they kept up the pace, crashing through the forest not far behind him. He stumbled on blindly through the blackness, vaulting along on the shaft of his spear. His arms grew heavy, his legs were like stones. The trees, the shadows, the night itself became a tangled wall, holding him back as he plunged into the darkness. How long he ran, Tao did not know, but little by little the shouts and footsteps began to fade. He continued on until he was sure it was safe. Panting and out of breath, he had almost reached the river. He stopped and looked around. The wolf dog was not behind him. Ram, he whispered, searching the darkness. Where are you? He waited, listening. Nothing moved. He wondered if Ram had been caught. Maybe the wolf dog had been killed and the hunters had turned back, but he heard nothing. Silence and darkness added to his gloom. His head throbbed and he turned to go back. But once again, he saw Ram slink out of the shadows, whimpering, creeping up to him on his belly. With a rave, wave of relief, Tao stooped down and threw his arms around the animal's shoulder. He spoke to him firmly. You cannot come into the camp of the clan people, he said. They have no love for the wolves. They will kill you. Tao pushed the little animal. Go, 
he said sharply. Go back and wait in the slough. Rayon looked up, panting, his tongue lolling out of the side of his mouth. Tao reached down to pick up a stone. Immediately, the wolf dog turned. He looked back once or twice and disappeared into the darkness. Tao grinned. At last, he had found a way to make the wolf dog understand. Tao walked lightly as he returned to camp, but he put on an angry face. I could not catch him, he said to the hunters who had gathered by the fire, but he is far gone. He will not return. Please stop here and consider question number 11. Volt grunted, slamming his fist into the palm of his hand. It is an evil sign, he said, rubbing his scarred cheek with the back of his hand, his dark shaggy head nodding. It is an evil sign. We must watch for him and kill him, said Garth. Sometimes Garth sounded more like Volt than Volt himself. He will not, we will not let him get away again. Tao felt his stomach turn. The next morning, after he had banked the fires with three younger boys of the clan, Tao walked out along the foot of the limestone cliffs far away from camp. The ash gray walls loomed high over his head and he came to a spot with many caves. This is a good place, he thought. Here I can make images away from the eyes of Volt and the hunters. Yet, it is close enough to visit Kala and bring back food to her and the clan people. He looked up at the steep rocky ledges and started to climb. It was not easy, but he was able to cling to the crevices and strunted pine shrubs growing out of the cliff wall. The first two caves he saw were not to his liking. One was too small and the rough, walls were rough and uneven. The second had an animal smell. Tao did not wish to share his home with a leopard or a bear. About halfway up, he found a third one. It looked over the flat valley. He saw no cold marks and he was sure it was deserted. It was about ten spear lengths long and opened into a small cavern. The walls were smooth with only a few breaks or cracks. This is what I am looking for, he thought. This will be a good place to stay. Certain that he had found what he had wanted, Tao spent four days filling his cave with dried grass, firewood, and kindling. Kala gave him a bearskin robe and a tallow lamp made of a large cockle shell filled with animal fat and a wick made of peat moss. She showed him how to dry cattail roots and burr bear burr reed tubers for cooking. She wrapped live embers in a handful of wet grass, placed them in a hollow bone, and gave them to him for his fire. When his cave was ready, Tao went down to the little stream that ran through the willow wood and found a bank of yellow clay. He scooped out some of the clammy substance, rolled it into long pieces, and let them dry in the sun. He picked oak twigs and burned them in the fire to make sticks of charcoal. This then, he stepped back and looked around his little cave. With his chunks of clay and charcoal and a handful of moss for a wiper, he was ready to become a maker of images. He had no picture or sketch to work from. He would have to draw from memory. He picked up a stick of dried clay. It felt good in his hand and he made a mark on the gray wall. It showed up bold and sharp. Mm, I will draw a horse, he thought. Even though no one else will see it, I will know what I have done and I will feel good. He started with the head, drawing the long face and the square jaw. Next, he sketched in the ears and the gentle curve of the neck. He worked quickly, trying to see in his mind's eye how the horses looked when he saw them out in the valley. With firm strokes of the chalk, he drew in the muscular body, the shoulder, the arched rump, and the tail. Then he tried to draw the legs. His hand hesitated. Did the front leg bend just below the body or farther down? He could not remember. The hind legs were even more difficult. He thought they slanted toward the tail, then bent forward at the knee, but where was the knee? He wasn't sure. He went on, his hand moving across the wall. When he was finished, he stepped back. Ugh, it's not right, he thought. The legs are all wrong. Impatiently, he rubbed it out again with a handful of moss and started again. This time, he drew the body first, adding the legs and the long sweeping tail, but when he drew the head, it was too big for the body. He shook his head peevishly. It's not good, he said. It looks more like a bear. He tried again and again, but each time it only seems to get worse. He tried, tried drawing a row of heads, then a row of bodies, but they didn't match. He shook his head in frustration and threw the chalk against the wall where it broke in a hundred pieces. I'll never learn, he said. He sat on the cold floor, brooding for a while. Then he picked up another piece of chalk and tried again. All day long, he drew horses, small horses, running horses, all kinds of horses. He forgot to eat the ground plums Kala had given him. He forgot to make his drink of birch tea. The harder he tried, the more trouble he had. He dropped a chalk and lay down on his bearskin rug. 
tired, angry, and discouraged, and he fell asleep. Please stop here and consider question number 12. When he awoke the next morning, it was quiet. He looked around. There was no smell of callous fire, no sound of voices, and he remembered he was alone and he was hungry. He climbed down the cliff and made his way across the valley. When he reached the river, he turned west and continued on until he came to the slough. The trees and vines were green with new leaves. The black loam was thick with uncoiling firms, ferns, and the dank bottomland smelled sweet and earthy. He stopped for a moment and looked around to be sure no one had seen him. Then he pushed on through the thickets and into the slough. He had long forgotten about evil spirits and demons, and he stopped to look at the stream to feast on watercress and mussels. No longer hungry, he went down into the glades where he hoped to catch a rabbit or even a young pig. He was searching around the clumps of dwarf oaks when he saw Rand come running through the tall grass. He smiled broadly. He was surprised to see how well the little wolf looked. Ram had gained weight, and his silver-gray fur coat was clean and smooth. The animal crept up to him whimpering, holding its head low. As Tao reached down to pet it, it rolled over on its back and licked his hand. You are growing, said Tao. Someday you will be a fine wolf dog, but you must learn to stay away from the clan people and the hunters. Come, he said. Now we will hunt together. All that morning they hunted through the slough, catching rabbits, field mice, and a willow grouse. With Ram trotting at his side, Tao started back for his little cave. He looked around again as he crossed the open valley to make sure no one was watching. Once in the shelter of the cave, they were safe. Here, Tao started the fire from the old embers and roasted the grouse and the rabbits. The sun had not yet set behind the hills, and the golden shafts of life streamed in through the cave entrance. Ram was standing in the opening, and as Tao ate, he saw the wolf's dog's body outlined against the pink sky. Quickly, he pushed aside his food and picked up a piece of chalk. He began sketching hurriedly, trying to catch the animal's form and shape. He worked swiftly, his hand gliding over the cave wall. He drew in a sharp muzzle, the pointed ears erect and alert. His hand flew in curves and swoops, catching the lithe beauty of the silver gray body. He stepped back and looked at the picture. Then he picked up a stick of charcoal and added the slitted eyes and the coal black nose. This time he was pleased and he did not rub out the drawing. He knew now that if he had something to go by, something to guide his eye, he could make an image true and without mistakes. Please stop here and consider question number 13.